Well, I'd like to welcome you back to What's Up with Prophecy today. We're going to continue with our studies on God's salvation plan. As you know, I have broken it down into four stages. We've already covered stage one, and today we're going to start into stage two, and I call it the teaching plan. So this will be our curriculum now for the next couple of videos. So we'll be studying the, the elements of the tabernacle in the desert. And this is called part 2a. Well, God told Moses when he was up on the mountain, he said, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so that I can live among them. And he continued, he said, you must build it according to the exact plans that I'm going to give you, the pattern that I'm going to give you. And I'll show you this. This is found in Exodus 25. So what did he mean when he said he was going to give him a pattern? Well, this is kind of like a, a, a dollhouse that a, a child would have. This dollhouse is a miniature of the real thing. So you would have a real house here, and you would have a dollhouse that would be a miniature of the real thing. It would look similar to the real thing, but it wouldn't be exactly the same. So that's what God told Moses. Build the uh, temple in the desert, build me a sanctuary, and build it according to my plans. Now, could he have built it exactly like the one in heaven? No. But he built it according to God's teaching plans that he gave to uh, Moses. So, the question is, are these two houses here 100% identical? Is the child's playhouse 100% identical to the big one? Well, no, it isn't. It doesn't have the plumbing and the electricity, uh, and it, do it doesn't have all the little nuances that the big house has. So they're similar, but not exactly the same. So I want you to keep this in mind as we go through the uh, sanctuary in the desert and we look at the furniture and we look at all the various uh, sacrifices and rituals that were uh, taken place there. Keep it in mind that it's not exactly like the one in heaven. Now did God, God did instruct Moses to build a tabernacle in the desert. Don't forget there were 400 years over that in bondage uh, as slaves in, e in Egypt. So they had forgotten a lot of the uh, various rituals and things that they should be doing to honor God. So this tabernacle was a tool that God was going to use to reteach them some of these things. So the Desert Tabernacle was a teaching tool for God uh, with the Israelites to illustrate how God was going to rescue them, that's his children, from the consequences of their sin. So let's we'll see how he does this here as we go along. So here we have God's tabernacle in the desert. And the question is, why did God instruct Moses to build a tabernacle in the desert? Well, because he couldn't build the exact tabernacle that God had in heaven. That's very, very majestic. We have no idea how large it is. It could be, it could be light years in length and breadth and, and depth. So he, he, God scaled it down to something that the people on earth could understand. So, so God used this to teach and illustrate to the Israelites God's plan of salvation. Now you might ask, this plan of salvation, when did that occur? When did that plan actually come into being? Well, we find that over here in 2 Timothy uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. And it says, God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our, our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which 
was given to us in Jesus Christ. And when did he when did God give us this? It says here before time began. Now sometimes we just gloss over these words in the Bible and we don't really understand what they mean. Here it's pretty clear to me that the plan of salvation was put together by God the Father before he even created the universe. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So this plan of salvation is well thought out by God. Every element and everything that's going to occur and has occurred has been thought through by God. So let's take a look at this today now. So how were people saved in past ages? How were they saved? Jesus wasn't around. So how were they saved? Well, we could look at it like this. Now, I've broken down the various ages of uh, the, the Bible folks, Bible people, and I've broken it down into actually four different groups here. So the first one on the left here is the age of the patriarchs. Then we have the age of Israel, the age of Christ, and finally the millennium. So were people always saved by grace through all these, this time? So let's take a look at this. So I've broken it down into these three major slots here, and let's see how people were saved during each one of those periods. Well, in this first period we read, it says, by faith, they sacrificed animals for their sins. So by faith, they sacrificed animals for their sins. So the sacrifices pointed forward to Jesus' future sacrifice. So they were saved by the faith that, that these sacrifices were po pointing towards Jesus. In my last video, uh, if you haven't seen it, you need to go take a look at it. It's about uh, 10 or 12 minutes long. And I go through all the various sacrificial altars, all the way from the Garden of Eden, all the way up through uh, this period of time that we're going to be looking at today, when they had the sanctuary in the desert, and all the way up to Jesus' time. So that's a real key one. But it, the, the prior video that you can look at shows that all the people in the age of the patriarchs, they knew about sacrifices and altars, that pointed forward to Jesus. Okay, so let's look at the age of Israel. So the sanctuary service during this time transferred the people's sins to the innocent lamb and then to the tabernacle. So your sins and my sins when we went to the altar and sacrificed that lamb, we put our hands on the head of the lamb and our sins were transferred to the lamb and then finally, they were transferred into the tabernacle. Okay, now let's look at the age of Christ. Now, Jesus' sinless life and, and death on the cross paid the penalty for our sin. He paid the penalty. And so by faith, as we accept Jesus' sacrifice, we are saved also. So today we're going to be looking at the age of Israel. We're going to be looking at the sanctuary in the desert. All right. So let's take a look now. and We're going to start our investigation in the t tabernacle of the desert. Now I'm going to keep this real simple. Today we're just going to be looking at the furniture and the basic uh, layout of the tabernacle. So we're going to build on these videos one after the other. So be sure you watch all of them in succession. So remember, now this is really key. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats that are sacrificed should take away your sins. That's in Hebrews. That's in the New Testament. So these animals that were sacrificed, they didn't do anything for our sins. They only illustrated to us of the sacrifice that Jesus was going to take in being crucified on the cross. So these uh, sacrifices look forward to the fact that Jesus was going to pay the penalty for our sins. Where in the Bible does it say that Jesus 
uh, is the lamb that takes away our sin. Well, it's in John 1, 28. It says, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Look, the Lamb of God, that's Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. So this is well established that it's not the animals in the Old Testament that we're going to be studying. They did not really take away people's sins. They were just an example for us on what Jesus was going to do and people's faith in that service was counted for them righteous and they were saved by that, that ritual. Now here we have a picture of the tabernacle uh, out in the desert. And you can see from this picture that the uh, tabernacle sat in the middle of all the tents here, of all the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. So it sat in the middle. And you can see here, and I'll cover this here in a minute, but you can see a plume of smoke arising from that tabernacle. And you also see in the front another uh, amount of smoke there. So do you wonder what these two smokes in indicate or what they are, are actually showing? We'll, get, we'll cover that here in a minute. So the tabernacle was laid out somewhat like this northeast, south, and west, and the various tribes encamped around this square like this. And in the center of the square, well, the Levites, they were the priests of the tabernacle. So the tribe of Levi was, were the priests. So the tabernacle was situated in the center uh, of that uh, square. And you can see that the entrance was looking, I guess you would call it looking eastwards. So there was only one entrance to this tabernacle, and it was looking eastward. Now let's take a look at what's involved with the tabernacle. Now we're going to go through a simplified overview of the furniture. Now as we do our further videos, we'll go into each one of these uh, furniture pieces and go further into the ritual and the, the, of each one of the ceremonies here. So you can see this is the entrance from the east side and that's where you would come with you and your family when you wanted to confess your sins when it was your month to go to the temple to confess, confess your sins. Each tribe had a particular month that was assigned to them to come to the tabernacle and confess their sins. So they would come to the front of this uh, entrance here and meet with the priest. So the area in front of the, the, the tent is called the courtyard. And so you'll see that in the Revelation and other places. It'll, be, it'll mention the courtyard. And that's what we're talking about. The next thing we're going to look at here is what is called the, the bronze altar. And the bronze altar is also called the altar of burnt offering uh, uh, in some of the writings, or it's also called the brazen altar. So it has three different names, but it's all referring to the same thing. This, this is where you would bring the animal and uh, the head of the family would lay its hands on the, the animal and uh, cut its jugular vein, kill the animal, and then the animal would be uh, burnt on this uh, altar. Okay, so the next thing we have here is a laver, which is not too common a name, but a laver is just a water basin. This is where the priests would wash their hands and their feet before they went into the, the, the tent building there. So that building is called the Tent of Meeting. That's what it is in English. It's a little bit of an odd name, but it's called a Tent of Meeting. And uh, that was towards the back of the sanctuary. And then there are two rooms, and I'll cover these here in a moment. There are two rooms in the tent of meeting. The first one is called the holy room, and the second one is called the most holy room. So the one in the front is the holy room, and the one in the back is the most holy room. And then we're going to see inside the, the holy room, inside the holy room, we'll see this here again in a second, there is... Uh, uh, golden candlesticks 
There's also what is called a table of showbread. That's where the, there would be bread put on that um, table. And finally, there would be the altar of incense. So these are the main uh, parts of the, the, the tabernacle. And then finally, in the most holy room, is, is really, just like the name says, this is where the Ark of the Testimony is kept, and this is where God would meet with the high priest once a year in the, uh, in the Most Holy Room. So these are the key uh, elements of the sanctuary. So it's really not too many things to keep track of, but, and it is fairly simple. There are many books written about all the various details of the uh, sanctuary, and um, you may enjoy reading those. They're more detailed. I'm not going to get into that in these videos because it does make them kind of long-winded and I can, you can kind of get lost and miss some of the, the key elements if you go too deeply into some of these things all at once. But I do recommend you uh, find a book that will go deeper into the uh, explaining the temple. Okay, so let's take a look at the tent of meeting. Now that was that that building in the back that had a, a, a canvas tent over the top. Actually, it wasn't canvas, it was different animal skins. So this tent of meeting, we're going to blow this up here. And this is just a photo I took of my, uh, I have a little plastic um, toy, you might say, uh, of the temple in the desert. And I've just taken some pictures of that, so it's a little bit rough here. But I think you can get the idea. So there are, were two rooms, as like I, I've said. There's the holy room and the most holy room. And so the you would initially you would go into the most the holy room, and the priest has various things he does in that room uh, every day of the year. And then the most holy room is where he would go into that room once a year uh, on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, as they call it today. So these are the two rooms, the Holy Room and the Most Holy Room. So what's inside of each one of these rooms? Well, as I mentioned, there's the golden candlesticks. Uh, it's on one side of the room. The uh, censer, now a censer, we don't usually think of that too much nowadays, but a censer is used to hold the ashes, hot ashes, uh, to uh, start a fire, or to move a fire from one place to the other. And so the censer is used in one of the ceremonies uh, in the uh, Most Holy Room. And I'll cover that in a future video, all right? But it's uh, kept in here in this room. And we also have the golden altar of incense. And finally, we have the golden table of showbread. Now, some of these um, things in the uh, Holy Room are of solid gold, and some of them are just overlaid with gold. So the golden candlestick, that was made out of solid gold. Uh, I don't know what the sensor was made out of. It's probably sort of a brass or a copper, uh, I would guess that. Uh, the golden table of showbread, that was overlaid with gold, and the uh, altar of incense was also overlaid with gold. It was not solid gold. So what else do we have here? We have the Most Holy Room, and that's where the Ark of the Testimony, and it's also called the Ark of the Covenant, is located. And uh, we're probably familiar with that term from some uh, various movies that have made that a famous thing when they're looking for this, trying to find the, the lost Ark of the Testimony or the lost Ark of the Covenant. So that's more or less here the key elements that you need to remember about the uh, Holy Room and the Most Holy Room. So, how did God show his presence in, to the people in the, uh, the 12 tribes? How did he show his presence? Well, you could see that a plume of smoke rising there. Now, this was some artist's rendition. Uh, I'm not sure what, what he had in mind. But really, the Bible does tell us how God showed himself to the people of Israel. 
And it says in Exodus 40, verse 38, it says, So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and was in the cloud, was fire in the cloud by night. So all the houses of Israel, everyone around there, the way it was laid out in a, in a, in a square there, everyone could see that. So they could see that God was leading the Israelites by day and by night. So this is what it might have, uh, an illustration here. So by night it was a pillar of fire. Can you imagine going out and looking at the tabernacle and seeing a fire coming out of the, uh, above it? And that was, shows that God was present there. He was present in that tabernacle. And of course, by day, uh, there was a cloud and God led the Israelites on their journeys uh, with this cloud. Where the cloud went, they went. Well, we, today we've identified the key furniture that was used in the tabernacle. That was the main purpose of the video today. And I hope you take a look at it again and kind of keep in mind what each one of the pieces are. And we will go through these in more detail uh, in the uh, future videos. So in our next video, I'm gonna show you a typical service that was conducted in the tabernacle every day. So we'll see how these furnitures uh, work, if you will, with the service. We'll see how, what the people uh, do, how, how they get forgiveness for their sins. We'll see what the priests do, uh, etc. So that'll be a, a very interesting uh, video to follow up on this. So I hope you are looking forward to that and you'll be looking for that here in a, in a few days when I release it. Well, you know, I re produce these videos and I release them on uh, YouTube and I release them on my podcast channel. So if you get a blessing from these, uh, if you can hit the subscribe button and the like button. Now, why do I ask you to do that? I do these 100% for free. I don't charge anything for them. I don't ask for money. This is my, uh, for, my for my love of God. I want to share his story that he has in the Bible with as many people as I can. So I use YouTube and I use podcasts also. I'll talk about that podcast in a second here. But, you know, the more times people will subscribe to my videos and hit the like button, that will be an indication to YouTube that this is something that they should promote more. So if people are looking for uh, videos on the sanctuary in the desert, for example, mine might pop up a little bit higher and get more uh, views. Now, I don't get anything, I don't get any money when more people view it, but I just want to spread the good news that, you know, Jesus and God have a plan for saving you and me, and this plan is going right along on schedule. It's not ahead of schedule, it's in schedule. And the more people that can view these, it's, it's just a, a blessing for them. So I hope you'll consider doing that. The other thing I want to mention is podcasts. Podcasts are quite interesting. I've been doing these for a number of years, and I have apps. You know, if you have a smartphone or a tablet, you can get little apps to do various things. Well, I have apps that if you don't want to go to YouTube, you just want to use the app, you can get all of my videos on one of these apps. So I have them for Android uh, products, I have them for Apple products, and of course, you can get them on YouTube anytime you want. So you can get them on any of those. So I hope you'll consider maybe downloading one of these apps for your whatever phone you have, and then you'll never miss a video in the future. Now, I don't get any money for this either. This, I'm not sure if these are, they're still charging for these. They used to be uh, one or two dollars uh, and it's a lifetime buy, but I think they're free right now. I should check on that. But anyway, uh, these are available and it's convenient if you just uh, download this and then you, every time you want to go look at a video, they're all listed there. You can just tap on whatever one you want, 
You don't have to go looking all over YouTube to find them. Well, and oh, by the way, when you do go to the Android store or the Apple store, if you type in the words Bible Prophecy Revealed, you'll see my videos with a little yellow circle where it says Bible Prophecy Revealed. All right. So I hope you consider doing that. Uh, it may be of a, a convenience for you. And uh, anyway, that's that is available. Well, this is the end of the video today, so I hope you come back and watch the video for next month. Thank you very much.